Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Amanda Vinicky. Brandis Friedman is on assignment on the show tonight. We're starting the year with a higher number of staff at all levels, especially teachers. Class is back in session for CPS students two weeks earlier than usual. What's behind the new calendar and how is the district addressing staff shortages? Plus, Illinois is the first state to require Asian American history be taught in public schools starting this school year. How educators are approaching it in their classrooms. A Chicago commission says statues of Christopher Columbus should be gone permanently. We look at the other 40 city monuments up for debate. Leaders with Ford say the automaker is cutting thousands of jobs. That and more business headlines from Cranes. A dissolvable implant that could be the future of pain relief without drugs. That and other science stories in the news. A new report challenges the idea that Chicago has seen a decline in civic engagement. And a library in Garfield Park with some valuable artwork gets vibrant new work from its artists and residents. But first, some of today's top stories. Chicago public school students are back in class. It's an earlier start than in years past. CPS typically resumes the day after Labor Day. The mayor spent the morning at various schools throughout the city welcoming students back. And the unifying thread between all these different schools, different campuses, different demographics, is the excitement and enthusiasm to be back in school in person. And of course, um, I've been happy to see all the new outfits, uh, the new hairstyles, the great kicks uh, that the kids have been wearing. And we'll hear from CPS CEO Pedro Martinez about COVID protocols, staff shortages, and much more coming up in the show. Meanwhile, the Chicago Teachers Union's newly sworn in president will not run for mayor. That's what Stacey Davis Gates said today, but she added that the next mayor should not be Lori Lightfoot. Why would I want to be one person when I can be with 30,000 of them pushing in coalition with the rest of Chicago? Look, Chicago knows what it needs. It needs a partner, it needs an organizer, it needs someone who's in love with humanity. We don't have that right now. And the Chicago Teachers Union is going to work, again, in other words, with, with others to get what we need. Prosecutors were back at it in the R. Kelly case. The Chicago R&B star is charged with child pornography, obstruction of justice, and the enticement of minors into criminal sexual activity. This morning, a federal agent for IRS criminal investigation testified about payments that were made to various people to allegedly protect Kelly against child pornography charges in 2002, including the parents of the star's former goddaughter, who's using the pseudonym Jane. Kelly was acquitted in a 2000. 2008 trial after Jane refused to testify. The trial is expected to continue for three weeks. One of the most well-known medical professionals is calling it a career. Dr. Anthony Fauci says he is stepping down as the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in December. He's also giving up his role as chief medical officer to President Joe Biden. Fauci started at the Institute under President Ronald Reagan 38 years ago. Before his work with the COVID-19 pandemic, he spent decades working on HIV AIDS. Fauci says he's not retiring, but moving into the next chapter of his career in science and public health. Up next, one-on-one -on -one with the head of Chicago Public Schools on the first day of class. Stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols. The Jim and Kay Maybe family the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. Class is back in session for Chicago Public School students roughly two weeks earlier than the usual post-Labor Day return. Many teachers and officials are hopeful they'll see improvements with a new calendar and additional staff positions this after two pandemic marred years. Others are concerned about filling CPS staff vacancies amid teacher shortage and bus driver shortages. And here to discuss all that and more is the CEO of CPS, Pedro Martinez. Pedro Martinez, welcome back to Chicago tonight. Uh, good to see you as always. I know you won't get official numbers uh, on this for a while. Uh, some worried that the early start to the year could dampen attendance. How were the numbers today? 
You know, it's still early, but actually our attendance numbers, just the early numbers we're looking at, are pretty consistent with prior years. So actually, uh, we feel really good about it. And remind us the rationale for starting two weeks prior to Labor Day this year. Yeah, so Paris, one of the things we did this year, which we hadn't done in the past, we actually did a survey that surveyed students, parents, teachers, you know, all staff, including principals. And one of the things that uh, the reason this calendar got chosen was because this calendar is a balanced calendar. It, we actually end the first semester before Christmas break. In the old calendars, our students, uh, you know, would go on Christmas break, but they would come back and have to take semester exams. And this particularly affected high school students and middle school students. So we saw overwhelming votes from students, which were mostly high school, as well as our high school teachers wanting this calendar and principals overall also wanted this calendar. Parents were split. Uh, and so, you know, you know, I feel really good about it because even though we're starting earlier, I have to remind everyone, we're also going to get out a week earlier. So I think when we get to June, people are going to be very grateful that we're ending earlier in June. And, and this is in line with a lot of suburban school districts. Uh, in fact, most of them, uh, as we know, COVID hasn't been the only disruption uh, to learning over the past two years, but lots of uh, labor strife. I know that CPS and CTU hammered out a safety agreement before they went back to class this year. Are you predicting smooth sailing and uninterrupted classes this year? I am. You know, we're working very collaboratively with the CTU and our partners. And so I, I feel really good about this year, Paris. First of all, we've learned a lot about COVID. Uh, our safety protocols are stronger than ever. And, I, you know, I just, you know, I, I could sense the optimism both in our staff and our families. And I know with the safety plan uh, that the two of you agreed on, students don't have to isolate if they were exposed. Instead, they have to wear a mask. Uh, remind us uh, about some of the other points of this COVID protocol. Yeah, now, but the biggest, uh, the biggest change, and this came from the CDC, Paris, is what you said, you know, in the prior, in last year, many of our children were quarantined. That will, that will not happen this year. So the only children that have to isolate are children that are positive or have symptoms. When there is a case in the classroom, though, all children have to wear a mask during that 10-day period. We'll strongly encourage masking throughout the year, but we're not requiring it. But we'll have screening testing every week like we did last year, and we'll have home tests for everyone who needs it. And we'll have masks, we'll have supplies at every single school. And still at this point, only about a little more than half of students are vaccinated against COVID-19. Will CPS promote uh, further vaccination for kids? Absolutely, Paris. You know, we still have our four regional sites. We have 22 school-based clinics as well. And we have all of our mobile events. And even though our percentages, you know, we like them to be higher, we're actually exceeding the nation in every, in every age level. And, every, and actually every month we still see increases in vaccination, especially with our older students. So you're saying if there's a case in a class, uh, everyone in the classroom is going to have to wear a mask. Are there metrics to where uh, there is an outbreak in a classroom or at a school where those classes or schools might have to be shut down? So Paris, so the first, so an outbreak is, is uh, actually identified by the Department of Health uh, here in the city, and we work with them on every single case. And you know, what would happen first is we see multiple cases in classrooms. The whole classroom, uh, the whole classroom definitely would mask for 10 days, but also it could be the entire school. So we would first put in those steps, and then if things, you know, got worse, then definitely we'd look at, you know, doing some, uh, you know, other, other measures. I know you're happy, teachers are happy, parents are happy, uh, no pandemic disruption uh, so far this year, although over the last two years, a lot of data suggesting that, you know, uh, learning from home did cause some disruption to learning and social and emotional well-being of students. What, what uh, things are in place at CPS to deal with those things in students? So, Paris, a few things. So, one, last year, we actually, even though it was a difficult year for our families and our staff, we actually saw a stabilization of academic measurements. Uh, and in fact, in some, especially at the high school level, we're starting to see uh, upward ticks of academic uh, progress, especially when you look at scholarships. I'm optimistic about, you know, children going to college, graduation rates, uh, and, and we stabilize at the elementary level. For this year, though, we want to make sure it's our strongest year ever. So we have multiple levels of support from intervention teachers in schools. We also are investing $25 million in tutors. We'll have over 700 tutors across our schools. We will also have academic coaches working with teachers, teachers maybe that are new, that need more support. So those are just some of the examples of the supports that will be as well as robust after school programs. And this is coming amid a nationwide teacher and staff shortage. I think you've mentioned something like 900 uh, staff positions that still need to be filled. Let's hear what CTU President Stacey Davis-Gates had to say about that today.
What we need to do is figure out pipeline, right? We have paraprofessionals, right? Teachers assistants. How do we get them in a pipeline to become um, educators, right? How do we pay them for it? Because many of these women um, are heads of their households and they already make an income that's not high enough. So how do we put a stipend on that experience and get them through the program? We know they're already invested. We know that. They retire from the system. Let's make sure they become teachers. This teacher and staff shortage, obviously an issue being felt in school systems all across the country. How do you plan to fill some of those vacant positions? So, you know, the good news for us is we actually have very strong pipelines, Paris, and I agree with Stacy. So, for example, we do have a, a large cohort of paraprofessionals that are becoming teachers as we speak. I also love our, our Teach Chicago Tomorrow, which is high school students, that we help them get into community colleges and universities with scholarships to get their teaching degrees. And so those are pipelines that we're already, uh, especially our, our paraprofessionals, we're already leveraging now. Uh, but we need, to, we need to do more. Uh, we have, if there's a lesson that I learned is that we need to do more. We will have about 900 vacancies, Paris, but that's in comparison to this. This last year, we had about 700 vacancies. Overall, we're still going to be about 300 teachers above last year's levels. And so even though there'll be some individual school issues that I still want to make sure I look at, overall, we are looking uh, stronger than last year. And in better shape uh, than some other school districts, which I know are, are struggling uh, to fill teaching positions. Although uh, CPS does have a bus driver shortage as well. Some students, as a result, have to ride more than an hour to get to school. How will that play out this year? Yes, Paris. So, you know, that's something I'm looking at very closely. The good news is we're routing close to 16,000 students, uh, you know, this in this first few weeks of the school year, which is the most we've done in, a, in quite a while. Uh, that is stretching some of our routes to be longer. We are looking at them over 80 percent. 80 percent are under an hour. We want to get as many under an hour as possible. So that's something we're looking at. We still have a shortage in, in bus drivers nationwide, but we've increased our pay rates uh, from $16 entry to now $20 up to $25 with experience. And so that's going to that's stabilizing our workforce. Plus, we have vans, we have taxi cabs. But I just ask parents, be patient with us. The first two weeks are always, you know, they're always hectic. And so the goal is, is you know, we're going to continue to route more students uh, and, and, and continue to look at those route times. All right, I want to get to kind of a bigger picture, long-term issue that you're dealing with here. According to a Chalkbeat report, 30% of CPS schools have fewer than 300 students. The smaller the enrollment, the higher cost per pupil uh, to the school system. And I know a lot of parents and students and teachers still, uh, there's a lot of fallout from the school closures from about 10 years ago. What do you do with those under-enrolled schools? Yeah, Paris, it is a challenge for our district, and I will say, you know, we are expecting another enrollment decline this year, not as not as high as we saw during the pandemic years. We, we lost almost 25,000 students during the two pandemic years. It'll be, it'll be less than that, but we still are expecting enrollment declines. We've been in enrollment declines for more than a decade. And so for us, what I'm looking at is opportunity, especially with our under-enrolled high schools and elementary schools, around how do we improve the programming, make it attractive for our families and our students. So more to come, uh, Paris, we're actually going to be talking about it quite a bit in September. And so, and so more to come on that. I know this is a big uh, long-term issue, but for now, a happy first day of school. I know this is a, a day that you and educators and parents look forward to. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Paris. A long awaited report from a city commission on monuments recommends that Chicago's three Christopher Columbus statues be permanently removed from their public locations. The statues were at the center of violent racial justice protests two years ago. The committee has also recommended the removal of 10 other monuments due to depictions glorifying racist stereotypes and white supremacy. And joining us are Doreen Wiese, president of the American Indian Association of Illinois, and Pasquale Gianni, Avante Group President with the Joint Civic Committee of Italian Americans. We also invited the city to send someone with the Monuments Commission, but they declined to participate. Mayor Lightfoot did send a statement, which we will get to in a little bit. We do welcome the two of you for being here. Doreen Wiese, we see uh, 13 monuments in all recommended for removal. Did the commission make the right call here? It's so difficult. Um, even our own community was divided on some of the monuments. So I think that, uh, but on some of them, they were extreme. They were uh, extreme examples of um, images that are just not true for our people, for Native people in America. and. So that those those are the ones that um, that I think we had the most votes. If you say it, no surveys had votes, um, and so they were um, 
I think that the mayor did make the right move uh, in terms of looking at at least firing, inquiring in the communities what their what their views were because no one has ever done that before. So I have to, um, I, I, you know, I'm really honored that the mayor did do that and did ask for our opinions because there have been people that have really um, protested some of the monuments for many, many years I mean, going back to the 60s and the 70s and before even that. So I think that um, it's a good, it, it has started wonderful discussions about so Certainly the, the first comprehensive report on this that I know, and I know that it involved a lot of public input. Uh, Pasquale Gianni, you were actually a part of this. You were on this commission. Do you believe it was a thorough and fair process? Yes, thank you, Paris. Our organization was certainly part of the commission. Advisory commissions are routinely formed, uh, and their inputs are often followed, often partially implemented, sometimes uh, uh, ultimately not followed. Uh, in this case, I, I believe that the deliberations uh, were, were lengthy. Uh, they were they were very much uh, a, a process where community input was valued. Uh, but insofar as the Columbus statues concerned are concerned, we we are definitely uh, inclined to believe the mayor when she says that they will be a uh, return to their to their pedestals and that their removal in the summer of 2020 was temporary in the interest of public safety. I can understand and appreciate the very difficult position that Mayor Lightfoot was put in uh, at the time. And I believe she's a reasonable person and that we will work together with her to ensure uh, their re-erection uh, once a proper safety plan is in place. Right. And so, so to be clear, this commission is recommending taking down those three statues. Mayor Lightfoot has not committed to following uh, those guidelines yet. Let's uh, read a statement that she did send when this report came out. She says, what is clear is the history of both communities is intrinsic to our shared Chicago history, meaning Native American and Italian American. And the stories of both communities and all the nuances needs to be told, known, and respected by every Chicago. And we need to create more opportunities for bridge building, which will be to the benefit of us all. There are many more steps that will be taken on this long journey toward reckoning, understanding, and healing, and I look forward to more dialogue, public engagement, and the path forward. So again, kind of striking a, a middle tone here, not committing one way or the other. Doreen, we see the three Columbus statues. Remind us, and we've talked about this many times, but remind us why uh, you believe these should be removed permanently and, and why these are offensive. Well, first of all, they don't only affect our community. They affect the communities that were first had had first contact with Columbus. Uh, those were indigenous people from the Bahamas, the Cuba, Haiti, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Jamaica, and Trinidad. And I think in the last uh, maybe 20 years, we've seen more documents come forth about those interactions. And really it's part of the, uh, what has spurred the idea of an indigenous day or an indigenous, an indigenous movement. They really involve people from around the world that are indigenous to their communities and some of the injustices that um, that were put upon them. Uh, actually, because Columbus never came to the United States, to North America, we're really, what our, our involvement in the, what happened to indigenous people came later on. And there have certainly been books written about how that Columbus really set the set, really set the leadership for slavery, and so then you have slavery. The it impacted African American people around the world, and that did impact the United States, and that did impact um, Native Americans as well because we were enslaved as and, well. And, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I wanted to get to Pasquale here. And again, these you know issues have been debated a lot. Is is there a compromise between you know American Indian community and the Italian American community? Uh, given what seems to be the historical consensus on Columbus now? Well, Paris, I, I do believe that there is that opportunity. Uh, I certainly, and I believe that the Italian-American community is certainly not against uh, an Indigenous Peoples Day and a further celebration in our city and our country uh, of the Indigenous history. That is why we truly believe that we should be in the business of addition when it comes to our monuments, our icons, our symbols, and not subtraction. I celebrate Columbus uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, I believe that Doreen may not celebrate Columbus. However, getting to that point requires an education uh, of, of the totality of the circumstances uh, and history, upholding the majesty of the truth. 
And by removing Columbus from the conversation, from the public sphere and square, we're engaged in this kind of eradication or canceling, if you may, which doesn't allow for that conversation to be had. Uh, it's, it's a narrowing uh, of the conversation, which ultimately is harmful for all. Uh, Columbus not only was a, a, a hero and, and, and developed as a hero for Italian Americans because of his ethnic origin, uh, but he engaged in what Neil deGrasse Tyson and others uh, have said was the most significant occurrence in the history of humankind. It opened the floodgates for hundreds of millions of immigrants to cross an ocean in search of a better life and contribute to this sweet land of liberty by bringing modern institutions like education, sanitation on a mask, and infrastructure. Those are things we all ought to celebrate. And real quickly, uh, Paris, on the point uh, of, of slavery, slavery already existed amongst the, the native tribes, as did uh, horrible institutions like cannibalism and human sacrifice, which the Europeans came to reject. So again, these are stories and histories that still need to be talked about. Uh, and removing Columbus uh, in, in, a, in a holistic manner uh, is not beneficial to that uh, conversation. All right, so we'll have to see what the mayor does. And we should note that there are 10 other monuments and statues here calling for being uh, taken down. Italo Balbo, uh, monument of Jacques Marquette, Louis Joliet. I wanted to get to some of those, but we are unfortunately out of time. Maybe we can talk about those uh, on another occasion. But for now, our thanks to Doreen Wiese and Pasquale Gianni. We appreciate it. Thank you. And up next, visitors to a West Side library can now enjoy museum quality art while they browse. So please stay with us for a look. We've made it. Justice Jackson's appointment to the Supreme Court provides a beacon of hope. Black women are underrepresented. We still rise. We still show up for one another. It's us investing in the next generation and giving them something to enrich the next generation with. There's museum quality artwork in Chicago that's free for anyone to see. It's in the city's first regional library, which opened in 1920 in the West Garfield Park neighborhood. The library has been renovated, and one of its newest features is a person, a resident artist. Producer Mark Vitale recently brought us this introduction to a young artist who brings vibrancy to her residency. Here's another look. The Legler Regional Library in West Garfield Park is home to a lot of books, naturally, but also valuable artwork and the studio of a new artist in residence. I am Haitian American, a very proud Haitian American visual artist, I'm very much interested in my culture, food, as well as art practices that span from painting to printmaking. I make work based on what I know and what I've experienced. So that comes from ancestors who have obviously gone on, but then also like current day family members who are still living now. Travels that I've taken throughout the African diaspora, vibrant colors because that's what I saw. So growing up, I saw Haitian artwork in my house. That was the first art I ever saw before I got to art history one and two in college. So. That's what I show is the vibrancy and the joy that I know. The residency gives the Miami-born artist a small studio in the library. Alexandra Antoine has filled it with works by artists that she admires and her own works, paintings with hand-sewn beaded sequins and collages that feature a lot of food. The other art form I'm interested in is culinary. <laughs> I consider every woman in my family a chef. So whether they went to school for it or not, they are what I call a chef. And a lot of people interested in food, especially me. <laughs> and she volunteers in the neighborhood. She calls it being in the mix. In the mix, but also like very intentionally like wanting to be in the mix, not just how can I volunteer here so two weeks down the line I can ask you for something, but really like how do we build this connection? Because I also live in the neighborhood. The Legler Regional Library is also home to Floating Family by the artist Elizabeth Catlett and the large-scale painting Knowledge and Wonder by Chicago artist Carrie James Marshall. That's the artwork the city had planned to auction for millions in 2018 until widespread criticism stopped the plan in its tracks. 
And there's a WPA mural from the 1930s with dated depictions of Native Americans and a modern response to it by Native American artist Chris Papan. All of these works will make good company for a new work by the current artist in residence. Alexandra will be here for two years and she'll be working with people in the community, with the students that we work with in the schools, um, adults, teens, children, and then she will be creating a, an art piece over the two years that will be uh, housed here at Legler. She was born for this. You know, she's here as an artist. She's here to create work, but she's here to work and connect with people as well. And I'm so excited that she gets to weave in her culture and her heritage and her passions. It is a big deal. Now, I have, I gotta be honest, I've done some artist residencies before. This one is new for me because it's in a library, which I also love. Like, I've always loved the library, but that is exciting that it is in a space where I can do research and do my art practice as well. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. And you too can get in the mix. Alexandra Antoine will be the artist in residence at Legler Regional Library through the end of next year. The library is located on South Pulaski Road in West Garfield Park, and you can see more of Antoine's work on our website. Now, Paris, tossing it back to you. All right, Amanda, thanks very much. And still to come on Chicago Tonight, a new marketplace to rent out unused parts of your house by the hour. That and more business news from Cranes. Illinois is the first state to require Asian American history in public schools. How educators are meeting that requirement starting this new school year. Right Could this dissolvable implant be the future of pain prevention without drugs? We review that and other science stories in the news. And a new report challenges the idea that Chicago has seen a decline in civic engagement. But first, some more of today's top stories. As you know, at this point, it's an early start to the school year, and the city's 80 safe passage routes are getting a little extra attention this week to make sure students get to and from school safely. And in the wake of the Uvalde, Texas school massacre, the Chicago Police Department says it is stepping up training for a possible mass shooting event. Meanwhile, students at Limblom Math and Science Academy staged a walkout on the first day of school. The students were protesting the dismissal of longtime assistant principal Karen Fitzpatrick Carpenter, also known as Mama Eagle. Parents and alumni also joined the protest in front of the selective enrollment high school. CPS said in a statement that, quote, it's ultimately up to each principal to develop their team. After two decades at Limblom, Fitzpatrick Carpenter says she is looking for a new job within CPS. And the city is looking for a few good poll workers. Election judges make up to $230, and election coordinators can make up to $450 for Election Day. High school and college students can also apply to become an election judge. In order to apply, applicants must be U.S. citizens, a registered voter in Cook County, and be able to speak, read, and write English. Bilingual applicants are highly encouraged to apply as well. Ford announces it's cutting thousands of jobs. Deals for two local hotels mark some of the biggest sales in the hospitality market since the start of the pandemic. And knock, knock, there's a new app at the door for homeowners. Here to explain all of that and more is Crane Chicago business editor Andwear. And uh, great to see you. Starting with Ford, the CEO says it's cutting 3,000 jobs. We know it's got the South Side and the Chicago Heights plant. Any of those jobs in the Chicago area? As it turns out, no, and that's a good thing for folks who work down at the Torrance Avenue plant. Uh, we understand that of these 3,000 workers, most of them are going to be white collar layoffs and uh, layoffs of uh, personnel who work on a temporary basis at uh, offices, mostly in the U.S. and Michigan, also some in Canada and India as well. The Ford plant looks like uh, down on the south side looks like it'll remain untouched for now. Uh, but this is all part of the company's effort to simplify its operations and streamline because, of course, they're reimagining themselves as an electric vehicle producer. And uh, I think it's fair to say there are going to be more changes ahead, some of which might affect the Ford uh, plant in Chicago eventually. All right. So those uh, jobs spared for now. Uh, meanwhile, two distressed hotels in the suburbs. An investor is coming in uh, in some major deals uh, for those properties. Tell us about those. 
Well, there's a venture out of Oklahoma City that's headed by an investor named Mark Beffert. He's backed by a high net worth family in that area. He's plunked down just more than $34 million for the, the uh, nine-story uh, Hotel Orrington property in Evanston. He's also bought the nearby Weston Hotel there in Evanston. That, that price couldn't be determined. Uh, but these deals really do mark the biggest distressed hotel sales in the Chicago area since the pandemic began. And it's uh, a sign that at least some investors are seeing some future health in the local hotel market, which has been really battered. Uh, as you know, by uh, the travel cutbacks during COVID. And then uh, that Weston is in Itasca, correct? Oh, Itasca, I'm sorry, correct. Thank right, the, you. the Orrington and Evanston, the, the Weston and Itasca. All right, uh, lastly, a new app for homeowners who want to rent out space in their home by the hour. Uh, what is this all about? This company is out of California, but they are testing this concept here in Chicago to see if it'll fly. And it is just as you described it, Paris. It's uh, an app that allows people to rent out unused space in their homes on an hourly basis. Say you've got uh, a, a nice fancy kitchen set up in your basement that you never use or uh, you have an electric vehicle charging station in your garage that uh, goes unused for hours a day. You can turn those uh, assets into cash, apparently, if this app works. Uh, and people who need those services or access to that sort of thing, like a laundry room, say, for perhaps an hour or two a day, can pay and come into your home and use that stuff. It sounds like kind of a wild idea, but then again, the idea of having strangers uh, come and pick you up in their personal vehicles and drive you around seemed kind of odd a few years ago, and now that's Uber. So who knows? Totally commonplace. It's like Airbnb for your kitchen or your laundry room. Very interesting. We'll see how exactly. that app works. All right. Thanks, Ann. Thanks, Paris. And now to Amanda for a look at how teachers are incorporating Asian American history into their classrooms. Amanda. Paris, starting this school year, Illinois public schools must include a unit of instruction about Asian American history. Illinois is the first state to have this requirement. Governor J.B. Pritzker signed the Teaching Equitable Asian American Community History, or TEACH Act, into law last summer. Now, a year later, with students coming back to classrooms, it is taking effect. And joining us to talk about it are Grace Pye, the Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice Chicago, and Moise Bawani, a teacher at North Grand High School in Chicago. Thanks to each of you. Now, Grace Pye, you did help to get this law passed. Why do you believe it's needed? Well, you know, we've seen a really stark rise in anti-Asian racism over the last two years, but it's not something that's new. And I think it came as a surprise to a lot of people that Asian Americans were experiencing so much racism in the wake of COVID and all of the political rhetoric blaming China. We need to teach students the history, the honest history of the United States and show all the ways that Asian Americans both have been victimized and also have been champions of justice in their own communities and in solidarity with other communities. And Grace, we know that teachers are quite busy, but your organization is helping them prepare to teach Asian American history. How? Right, we know that teachers are completely overwhelmed. It's been a really rough two years, so we wanted to make it as easy as possible for teachers to get the resources that they need to teach Asian American history well. We're offering two hour virtual professional development workshops. We're doing that in partnership with organizations and districts and teachers unions. And we've also compiled a really wide ranging database of curricular resources that are free and publicly available online. So we did the research for them. One of the teachers who participated in one of our professional development workshops actually described it as a warehouse of resources that would take me weeks and months to find on my own. So, Moise, let's go to you. I imagine you might draw upon that, but actually you are Pakistani-American. So could you first talk about how your background and heritage has already played a role in teaching in your classrooms? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one, students are always interested in their educators. I, you know, I learned in my first year uh, how many students are so intrigued by who I was and where I came from and my stories whenever I had the chance to talk about my family and my journey here. Um, and I think those experiences are so profound because many of our kids don't get a chance to travel to different neighborhoods in Chicago. They don't get a chance really to get exposure to who lives here, their stories, and then end up, you know, as they listen and as they hear and as they study, they end up finding how much we have in common and how much they're interested in so many facets of different cultures, whether it's arts, food, social justice. 
so all of these things I learned really early in my first year and you know it became kind of a, a beckoning for me to try to introduce more Asian American studies in my classroom. And Louise, how do you anticipate that this law is going to change what you teach? Do you have lesson plans drafted? Yeah, uh, in my first unit, my fourth unit, which uh, my first unit, we're doing a comic book graphic novel study. I'm teaching the book Superman Smashes the Clan, which is this wonderful story by Jeannie Yang that does some parallels between Superman as an outsider, as, a, as someone from outside of the planet, and the Lee family that moves into Metropolis and the discrimination they face along with these deeper concepts of what belonging looks like and what belonging means to everyone. And then in my fourth uh, unit, I do a lot of poetry that exposes the students to uh, uh, the structure and style, but also the stories of people from the Pakistani Indian diaspora, the stories of the partition. Um, and we connect like the heartache and you know disjoint nature of what we've been through uh, to the structure and house, to, to the stories and allow students to also develop connections to their family. Sounds very interesting. I've had a lot of students who like to join your English classes. Grace, now to you. These teacher development workshops, they, they begin by dispelling common tropes and stereotypes about Asian American communities. What are some common misconceptions? Well, one is called the perpetual foreigner myth, which is the idea that all Asian Americans are not from here. Right? We see that being very pervasive in comments from you know, strangers and passerby, kind of verbal harassment, telling people to go back to the country they came from when their home is America and this is the only home that they've ever known. So that's a common misconception that I think it's important for educators not to accidentally perpetuate when they're teaching about Asian American communities. Another is the model minority myth, which is this idea that all Asian Americans are high achieving, highly educated, you know, well off people who don't actually struggle. And that couldn't be further from the truth. It really hides and erases the inequality that exists within the Asian American community, as well as the reasons why there are some high achieving Asian Americans, which is that those are the only immigrant Asians that the United States let in through our exclusionary immigration laws. So really breaking down those myths is important to help educators understand why those stereotypes exist and also how to combat them. And Grace, can you just briefly clarify what exactly is required? Is this an entire semester long unit or just that districts make sure that it is incorporated at some point when uh, from maybe kindergarten through fifth grade? How, how does that work? Right, so what's required is a unit and all school districts actually define units differently. Our strong preference, though, is that teachers, like Louise is doing, incorporate it throughout the school year, right? We're not saying you just teach three days of Asian American history and you're done. We really see lots of opportunities to weave Asian American history into everything else that educators are teaching. Maybe a first grade teacher already has a unit on culture and identity. Maybe a high school unit is talking about, you know, school segregation, but they're not talking about Mamie Tape and this historic school segregation case that a Chinese American family was a part of in the 1800s. People typically aren't connecting those stories, right, Brown v. Board to Mamie Tape. And so those are some of the opportunities that we see for educators to just teach a fuller version of history. And is there any enforcement? Absolutely. So the enforcement is the same for all mandates across the state. The Illinois State Board of Education will survey all schools. And when there's a new mandate like this one, they include that mandate for the first three years of this annual survey. So, you know, unfortunately, their scope is limited, right? There's only so much they can do to actually be in classrooms and make sure that teachers are incorporating Asian American history. But that's where we're really calling upon students, parents, teachers, you know, community members to really pay attention and ask their schools and their districts, hey, what's the plan to implement the Teach Act this year? Louise, now that this is a mandate, what do you hope comes of it? Honestly, I just I the biggest blessings of being an educator is getting our students to understand who exists uh, and who's out there and also kind of pushing them towards the lens of humanity right why the stories of others matter and why we should lens why should we should see it as an appreciation but also an opportunity to reach out and make some connections and build community together um it's beautiful right i think i often thought about my experiences and not being able to understand my story and my history and it kind of felt like looking in the mirror and not seeing anything back so the opportunity for Asian American students in our district to be able to learn, to learn their stories, and also for others from so many different backgrounds to learn the stories of Asian Americans in this country, it's just beautiful. I mean, this is what education's about, right? So well, that's best to you Louise as you for you and your students as this next school year vegans while you're teaching this and anything else. Our thanks to you, Louise Bawani, as well as to you, Grace Pye.
Thank you. Up next, a rundown of some of today's top stories in the world of science. Stay with us. Coverage of science and technology on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Joel M. Friedman, president of the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund. A new study suggests ant colonies work like a collective brain to make decisions. How racial discrimination could negatively impact brain structure, a surgical implant that could provide pain relief without drugs, and how a quirk of evolution gave humans our voice. Joining us now to discuss some of the latest science stories making headlines is Robbie Amias, Vice President of Education at the Museum of Science and Industry. And welcome back, of course, Robbie. And now, researchers at Rockefeller University have been looking at how ant colonies make decisions. Ant colonies making decisions. What did they find? <laughs> so uh, the researchers were investigating the ways that ant colonies make decisions as a group, not as individuals. And so we've probably all seen ants moving together, you know, especially this summer, maybe making a, a nest or following food, etc. And one of the things that is known is that ants will move in response to things like changes in temperature. Um, and so what the researchers found in this study was that ants can actually work together in a colony almost in this way similar to how networks of neurons work together in a brain. I regret to say that I have witnessed ants working as a collective, perhaps in an apartment once or twice. Um, so how did they go about figuring this out? It's not like you can interview an ant. That's right, but this was maybe cooler? I don't know. So they developed a system to basically disrupt the environment of an ant colony. Um, and then, which I thought was really fun, they labeled the individual ants with colored dots so that they could track their movement and then increase the temperature, right, to see what would, um, how that would trigger the ants moving. Moving. And what they found was that the colony moved to leave the, the nest when the temperature was raised to about 93 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and I think what was even more interesting was that it took a higher temperature to move a colony that was larger. So a larger colony was able to tolerate a uh, temperature increase more than a smaller colony. Um, and one of the things the researchers noted is that since there's no evidence that an individual ant can tell how big the colony that they're in is, they think there might be something like pheromones involved um, in communicating between the ants. And just briefly, what might this ha significance might this have for scientific research? So uh, just understanding, you know, how insects behave, I think is just an interesting scientific question in general. I am always astounded by the fact that, you know, if you take the amount of bugs in the world, they far outweigh like by many times over the amount of people in the world by weight. So they're a huge part of the global ecosystem um, and understanding how they work will help us understand really how our world works. All right, now let's move on to a study out of Emory University in Atlanta. And that's been looking at the impact of racial discrimination on the brain. Now explain what were researchers trying to understand. Yeah, so this study is really interesting. So this particular team of researchers had previously already shown that racial discrimination um, can have negative impacts on the white matter of the brain. And so that's part of the brain that's generally responsible for communicating between regions of the brain and the rest of the body. Uh, so the question they were trying to ask this, uh, this time was really to understand it at a deeper level, more detailed, um, and to understand correlations with negative health outcomes. And in particular, this study focused on black women. Um, and it's known for, it's been known for some time that there are significant higher vulnerabilities to certain illnesses that black women face, uh, things like heart disease, diabetes, chronic pain, et cetera. And they did find, in fact, that level of specificity, right? They did, yeah. So in this study, they recruited a group of black women um, and assessed them for health conditions, but also their reported experience on experiencing racial discrimination in their lives. Um, and then they conducted MRI scans on their brain to um, measure a way that water moves through the white matter. And what they found was in fact, women who had reported experiencing more racial discrimination had lower movements in certain areas of the brain that connect the left and the right hemispheres. Um, I think another thing that's interesting to note is that those same structures seem to link the racial discrimination and some health disorders that women in the study had. Unfortunate findings, but certainly very important ones. Let's move on to a study about pain relief. Researchers led by John Rogers at Northwestern University have developed a new device to relieve pain without the use of drugs. Tell us what they've created. So the Rogers Lab is really at the leading edge of this work for many years now, using small devices to monitor and respond to the body. Um, and this particular development is super exciting. It is a small, flexible, and dissolvable implant 
that can relieve pain without any drugs um, and on demand, so whenever it's wanted. And so in fact, when it's inserted into the body, it can control the pain signals of a specific nerve, giving really specific pain relief in the body. And how does it work? Uh, so this is super cool. I think there's an image of this, but the, the implant manages pain by using a combination of a liquid coolant and nitrogen gas, which are in separate chamber, uh, channels inside the implant. Um, and the implant itself wraps around a nerve. And so when those two substances are allowed to flow together, a reaction occurs that causes the liquid to evaporate. So when we think about evaporation, oftentimes we think about sweat. We cool down when we sweat because the sweat actually evaporates off our skin. That's similar to what's happening in the nerve. It's cooling down the nerve, which slows down the travel of the pain signals. And of course, being able to use something like that could have major advantages over addictive drugs such as opioids. But how far along in development is this? Is this something that we're going to be seeing soon in hospitals, for example? So hopefully, it's hard to tell. Uh, this research was done in rats, so it hasn't yet been tested in humans, but um, really exciting developments to, um, and to your exact point, thinking about ways to not use drugs, but also really specific on-demand pain control, uh, which will be really important. So I think we all should stay tuned. And now onto our last story, also involving animals. Scientists in Japan believe they have identified a key evolutionary development. It's of the voice box or the larynx, which has allowed humans to speak, but apes can't. Explain, what is the larynx do and what did these researchers find? So the larynx is our voice box. Um, we probably all, um, if you can kind of feel it when it moves in, in your throat, um, it contains our vocal cords, but it's also involved in things like breathing and swallowing um, in addition to talking and singing. Uh, and so the researchers looked at the larynx in more than 40 species of primates, of which humans are one type, um, and found that there are two key differences between humans and our relatives like apes and monkeys. There's a vocal membrane that we don't have, which kind of extends off the vocal cords, and then air sacs, which are thought to help other primates make really loud vocal sounds that we think about when we think of other primates. So if our voice box became less complex in evolutionary terms, why is it that we can speak but apes can't, at least in terms of complexity? It seems like it should be the opposite. It does. It seems like it's not totally clear. One of the things we know is just from evolutionary history is that humans split from our closest relatives, which are chimpanzees, about six million years ago. And so somewhere since then, the larynx changes are believed to have happened. Um, but what's believed to be possible is that maybe simple is better, um, that having a complex larynx might make it harder to have the kind of precision that humans have in their language. The vibrations that happen in our voice boxes are very precise to allow us to speak. Um, and so perhaps having fewer or less complex of a structure, excuse me, um, makes that more possible. Sometimes simple is better. And thank you for <laughs> simplifying and distilling all of that complex research for us. Thank you, Ravi Amayas. Thank you, Amanda. Up next, Brandis Friedman and a new report that looks at volunteering in Chicago. That's in a conversation that first aired on Chicago Tonight Black Voices. But first, a look at the weather. U.S. Census data says volunteering has declined in Chicago from 2009 to 2019. But a team of researchers at the University of Illinois Chicago say that's not the full picture. New research says previous data collecting doesn't include the wide range of community organizing in the city, oftentimes leaving out the work of black, Latino, and working class people. Joining us now with more are Chris Polis, a postdoctoral research associate with the Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy at the University of Illinois Chicago and one of the lead authors of this study, and Kennedy Bartley, senior legislative director with United Working Families. Thanks to the both of you for joining us. Chris Polis, let's start with you. So U.S. Census data showed declining rates of volunteering in Chicago from 26.7% in 2010, or 2009, excuse me, to 21.9% in 2019. But your data shows that that survey uh, had some pretty big gaps in how data was collected, especially when documenting the work of black, Latino, and working class people. What are those gaps? Yeah, that's right. And, and to be clear, it's the, the data itself, one of the things that we looked at in the survey is um, how civic engagement is actually being measured. And that has a, a real 
consequence then on data that shows racial disparities and volunteering and voting and that kind of stuff. Um, when we looked into the survey itself, uh, a prominent survey by the US, which the US, uh, sensei can, the US Census conducts, uh, we found that there were, uh, especially in volunteering, there were biases against counting um, volunteer activities that are going to be disproportionately practiced by Black and Latinx and working class people, such as like informal support networks or public meeting attendance. Uh, to give you a concrete, uh, those conducting the survey, um, they, they have a sort of helpful hint sheet that says what's included as volunteering, what's not included. Uh, an, an example of informal support next networks being excluded, um, they're instructed to say, you know, if somebody's, you know, asking what, what counts as volunteering, say building or repairing a house for through Habitat for Humanity, it's going to be counted as volunteering. However, if I, you know, help my neighbor repair their house, uh, for an exchange for, I don't know, them watching my kids or something like that, that's not included as a form of volunteering. And that's just one specific example. Public meeting attendance is, is another example. You're talking about public meetings uh, being a form of volunteering, um, and your research found that the racial gaps would diminish or reverse. Uh, the white to black gap would shrink from 11.9 uh, to 2.6 percentage points. The white Latino gap would reverse from 12.3 to negative 1.6 percentage points. Uh, Kennedy, uh, I, I know that when we introduce you, you're with United Working Families, you've got a job change coming up, uh, but what's your reaction to this data collection? Yeah, um, I, unfortunately, I don't think that there is much surprise in the fact that, you know, um, a, a field that is like historically and overwhelmingly white and male, um, would define, you know, civic engagement in a way that is largely leaving out swaths of people um, who are are taking, you know, control of their communities um, in the various way that ways that Chris has listed out and named out. Um, during my time at United Working Families over the past three years, you know, every city council meeting, you know, folks are organizing people to do public comment to make demands of city council, right? Um, I see like when working in the 20th ward um, of predominantly black and Latinx um, uh, region in the city of Chicago, I'm seeing like all black and Latinx organizers um, getting their neighbors to take charge of, of things happening in their communities. As recently as uh, earlier this week, you know, we turned in nearly 4,000 signatures from folks on the Black um, and Latinx South Side saying that they want to see a referendum on the November 8th ballot, you know. Um, also, you know, doing this work on the shoulders of folks who turned out historic numbers in 2016 to vote Anita Alvarez off of, I mean, uh, you know, out of office. Um, those were organizing efforts that were led by Black, Latinx, and predominantly, like, young um, folks. And so, you know, unfortunately, it's not surprising because of, like, you know, who was telling the story and is who was at the helm. How does this limit the scope of what organizers uh, can do if their work isn't being recognized by, uh, by politicians and institutions and, you know, the, the big nonprofits and foundations? Sure. I think like what it does is it, it creates a responsibility on the parts of organizers to make sure that the analysis that folks like myself and folks who I'm doing this work with and comrades who know that like how folks dictate our work does not actually like inform or impact our work. Um, I think that it like leads to folks being disaffected um, and, and engaging civically. Um, but I, I just think that it like creates a new onus on the part of organizers to like make sure that the analysis is even if like data scientists who aren't like movement driven or like, you know, come from a movement background are the ones defining our work as or as not civic engagement. Like we know what we're doing and like we are defining and redefining that for ourselves. Chris Polis, back to you. How can civic life be better measured? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, like the our approach in the report was asking the people that were doing the report. I mean, the question is what, like, why do we want to measure it in the first place, I think is is an important and interesting question. Uh, and in order to, to make that practically useful, I mean, what we did in the report was just ask people doing the work, what were barriers and what facilitated uh, civic engagement in the city of Chicago and got a wide range of answers. 
uh, that I think were, were pretty useful that we, we lay out in the report in terms of how foundations can think about this stuff and also actually how, how we can reframe civic engagement as, as uh, something that government policy has a big hand in playing. For example, consistent budget cuts to schools and mental health clinics and all this kind of stuff that does have an adverse effect on people's ability to uh, to get out, to volunteer their time and, and that kind of thing. Um, so rethinking those kind of policies as well as, you know, funding these, these social services is absolutely crucial uh, in encouraging civic engagement. Okay, that's a, a good place to leave it. My thanks to Chris Polis and Kennedy Bartley for joining us. Back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. And that's our show for this Monday night. Please join us tomorrow night live at 7. The Trump raid, upcoming elections, and much more. Local members of Congress share their views. And art vending machines, a look inside a new effort to help local artists sell their creations. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Amanda Vinicky. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and have a great evening. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm, and proud sponsor of programming that offers advice and strategies to enhance the physical and mental well-being of fellow legal practitioners in Illinois. time on Antiques Roadshow, some treasures come along in unusual ways. How did your grand